and welcome to One World Travel Channel. My name is Petra and I set up this little channel to show you some of the most beautiful areas on the planet which I travel to. I'm starting with a presentation on the Antarctic Peninsula. All the pictures you see were taken by myself except for the maps and the historical pictures. I went to the Antarctic 27 times. I used to work as an assistant expedition leader and as a historian and lecturer. The area I'm pre uh, presenting to you is the peninsula, the northernmost part of Antarctica. This is the area with the mildest climate and the most wildlife. Mildest climate in the summer months means minus 10 degrees Celsius to maybe plus one or two degrees Celsius. And the summer months in Antarctica last from November to March. The landscape in Antarctica is truly stunning and the best way of traveling there is of course by ship. There are expedition ships and sailing ships going that way and they usually leave from either uh, New Zealand or from Argentina or Chile. I always traveled from Chile or Argentina. Over the years, the uh, number of visitors to Antarctica has constantly risen. In 2019, 60, around 60,000 people traveled down south and the majority of them were from the United States of America, around 17,000. Compared to Europe, um, Antarctica is a, sm a bigger continent, Europe is smaller, but Antarctica is still only the fifth largest continent on this planet. All of Antarctica is constantly under ice, uh, depending where you are in Antarctica, the ice can be several kilometers thick, around 8 to 16 kilometers. But in the Antarctic Peninsula, there are in the summer months a lot of ice-free areas. To travel there, most people leave from the town of Ushuaia in Argentina, which is uh, the largest town on the island of Fireland or Terra del Fuego, the land of fire. Um, Ushuaia is a town of roughly 60,000 inhabitants. Um, it's called the southernmost city in the world. However, um, there is also a city in Chile called Puerto Williams, where there are only 2,000 inhabitants, but uh, it is uh, even further south than Ushuaia. Ushuaia is located on the Beagle Channel and it has a great port, um, both for uh, cruise ships and of course also a commercial port and an international airport. Terra del Fuego was discovered by Ferdinand Magellan and as he was sailing through the Strait of Magellan to his left side he saw a lot of fires. That's where the name Terra del Fuego comes from. On the way to Antarctica you might also, if you're lucky, um, past the island of Cabo de Hornos or Cape Horn. Cape Horn was um, discovered by two Dutchmen. Dutchmen in 1615. Cape Horn Island is the southernmost headland of the Terra del Fuego archipelago of southern Chile. It is widely considered to be the southern tip of South America. There is a small archipelago called Diego Ramirez, which actually lies further south. By the early 1600s, the Dutch East India Company held a monopoly on all Dutch trade via the Strait of Magellan. And in an effort to find an alternative route, the Dutch merchant Jacob Le Maire, together with his navigator Willem Schouten, set off to investigate a route to the south of Terra del Fuego. They wanted to reach the Pacific Ocean from the Atlantic. They were backed by the city leaders of the Dutch town of Horn and their expedition set off in two ships, the Eindracht and the Horn. The Horn was accidentally destroyed in Patagonia, so it was the Eindracht that actually discovered the Cape. And the Cape was named after the city of Horn and 
after the lost ship. On Cape Horn, there is a, a lighthouse and there are several monuments. The main monument is in the shape of a flying albatross and engraved there is a poem by Sarah Vial. It reads, I am the albatross that waits for you at the end of the earth. I am the forgotten soul of the dead sailors who crossed Cape Horn from all the season of the world. But they did not die in the furious waves. Today they fly on my wings to eternity in the last crack of the Antarctic winds. Once you make it up there, it's about 300 steps um, from the landing site to the top of the island. You can go also up the lighthouse and from the lighthouse you can also mail a postcard although it might take several months before it reaches the people you're sending it to. From Cape Horn we're traveling virtually south uh, through the infamous Drake Passage. The Drake Passage uh, lies between Cape Horn and the South Shetland Islands. It is the shortest crossing from anywhere to Antarctica and it was named after 16th century English pirate or privateer Sir Francis Drake. The Drake Passage is 800 kilometers long or 500 miles and it's usually very, very windy. The passage is open water and there is no landmass anywhere around the globe at the same latitudes. That fact contributes greatly to the famously rough seas that are often experienced there. Waves over 10 meters or over 30 feet are not uncommon at all in the Drake Passage, but it's perfect condition for albatross spotting, albatross um, like flying when there's a lot of wind because they don't need to flip their wings, uh, they're just sailing on, uh, on, in the wind. And uh, here we have a picture of the light mantled sooty albatross. After two days of sailing, we're arriving in Antarctica and we're usually first spotting a tabular iceberg along the way. Here we have a shadow of a, the ship um, on a tabular iceberg. I'm just giving you a short general introduction to the Antarctic Peninsula. Each time a cruise ship goes there, uh, the trip is totally unique. You will not visit uh, certain sites that are that you can book. Uh, it's actually the expedition leader that uh, pre-books visits to the sites with IATO, but um, then it's all depending on the weather and you might go to different areas after all if they are available. Um, the first stops are usually in the South Shetland Islands. Um, the South Shetland Island, Islands were discovered by uh, Captain William Smith on a British merchant ship called the Williams. He was trying to sail to Valparaiso in Chile in 1819 and he deviated from his route south of Cape Horn and on 19th uh, of February 1819 he sighted the northeastern point of Livingston Island. Smith later revisited the South Shetland Islands and claimed King George Island for Britain. Half Moon Island um, is one of the smaller islands that you visit there. It's very famous for its chinstrap penguins. It's just next to Livingston. Um, in the same area, there's also uh, Greenwich Island with um, very nice uh, colonies um, and we have King George Island. King George Island uh, is basically considered the downtown of the Antarctic Peninsula because it houses uh, eight national winter stations and five summer bases. A winter station is inhabited all year round whereas a summer base only has scientists there during the summer months. The Antarctic summer months are um, from November, October, November to February, March. King George Island is the largest of the South Shetland Islands. It's approximately 95 kilometers long and 25 kilometers wide. 90% of the island is permanently glaciated. 
There is a small amount of specialized tourist activity taking place there during the Antarctic summer month. Um, there is actually an airport. It belongs to a Chilean station and you can fly there from uh, Punta Arenas in Chile. That's a, a small town uh, on the Strait of Magellan. Some of the um, science stations are very happy to welcome visitors. I have a few pictures here of Arztowski station. That is the Polish station. Um, it was established in 1977 by 19 scientists and it was named for Henrik Arztowski. Arztowski was a Polish scientist who uh, accompanied the uh, Belgi Belgica expedition um, organized by explorer Adrian de Gerlach in 1897 and they returned to um, Europe in 1899. So they were away for almost three years and um, Arztowski was one of the scientists on board. Arztowski station is next to Admiralty Bay where it's a beautiful bay where the glaciers come down all the way into the sea. Traveling further south towards the Antarctic Peninsula, we're passing Deception Island. That's a natural harbor. Um, the natural harbor is hidden inside a collapsed volcano. So it's a caldera with a narrow entrance. The entrance is about 230 meters wide, 750 feet, uh, and it's called Neptune's Bellow. It is actually a very, very windy area. And uh, once you make it through this small entrance, you will see the remains of Hector Whaling stations um, to your right side. Um, Hector Whaling station was also used as British Base B and as that base was established in World War II. Since the early 19th century, Deception Island was a favored refuge point from the uh, storms of Antarctica. It was first used by the sealers and then later a Norwegian Chilean whaling company started using Whalers Bay as a base for their factory ships. Uh, other operations quickly followed suit and by the uh, 19, uh, early 1900s um, there were up to 13 factory ships based in Deception Island. The Hector whaling station did not actually process the whale blubber that was done on the ships, but instead it took the carcasses and uh, boiled them on shore uh, to extract additional whale oil. The whale oil was used um, in those days, for example, to produce uh, margarines, to produce um, various uh, items that we now use um, oil for and uh, it's also it was used uh, to uh, for lamps some cities in Norway were completely illuminated uh, with whale oil lamps in February 1944 the British established a permanent base at Whalers Bay it was occupied um, constantly for about 20 years and then uh, in 1967, a volcanic eruption took place. The volcano is still active to this day, but the last big eruption was in the 1960s. Um, eventually, the station had to be abandoned in 1969 after more eruptions. Here we have a historic picture of Deception Island of the volcanic uh, explosion in 1967. The first uh, person to ever see the Antarctic Peninsula was uh, Fabian von Bellingshausen and he spotted Antarctica on January 27th, 1820. Uh, he was actually in the service of the Russian Emperor and he came from Estonia and was of German heritage. There is today um, a station, a Russian station called Bellingshausen, which is also located on King George Island. The Antarctic Peninsula is highly mountainous. The highest peaks rise up to 2,800 meters. That's uh, over 9,000 feet. And these mountains are considered to be a continuation of the Andes. 
uh, with a submarine spine connecting the two. The first ever Antarctic tourist flight was operated by Lan Chile in 1956 and people were shown the Antarctic Peninsula from the air. To actually reach the mainland, a ship has to then cross the Gerlach Strait from the South Shetland Islands and uh, then you arrive at the actual mainland. Anwood Bay is uh, very splendidly scenic uh, and it's one of those places where you can uh, go ashore on the mainland. Um, the best place to do that is Nico Harbour. It's named after a whaling ship that used to anchor there in the early 1900s. Nico is also one of those rare places where you can set foot on the Antarctic mainland. Um, on the side, there is also a huge glacier called the Deville Glacier. There used to be an Argentine refuge hut, but it blew away in a storm a couple of years ago. The most uh, famous and touristic spot in Antarctica is called Port Lockroy. It's a former British station called Base A, and it is now a museum showing how researchers once lived in Antarctica. It also has a British post office and a very large souvenir shop. After its discovery in 1903 by the French Antarctic Expedition, the area around Goodyear Island was used for whaling. During World War II, the British Base A was established on this island as part of Operation Tabarine. Tabarine was like a smallish expedition launched from the UK in 1943 and it established several permanently occupied bases in Antarctica. Base A was originally meant to be erected in Hope Bay, but ice conditions prevented the ship from landing there, so the tiny Goodyear Island was chosen instead. In, uh, um, after the war, this uh, station was used as a British research station, and it was manned uh, by four to nine people until it finally closed down in 1962. And then in the 1990s, Port Lockroy was renovated and made into a museum and a post office that it is today. Under the Antarctic uh, Treaty, um, the site is named number 61 and it is a historic site. The proclamation lists a total of 76 historic sites and monuments in Antarctica. That's the main building. And inside the main building, everything is as it looked in the 1950s, including a painting of the station Sweetheart. Traveling further south, you hit the Le Maire Channel, which is a strait located between the Antarctic Peninsula and Booth Island. It's also nicknamed the Kodak Gap by some because it is such a popular destination. The channel is only 11 kilometers long but millions of pictures have been taken there, hence the Kodak Gap. Um, it is uh, 1600 meters wide and it was first discovered by a German expedition, but they didn't traverse it. It was first uh, sailed through by the Belgica and named after Charles Lemaire, a Belgian explorer. Um, he explored Africa, the Congo, but he has a channel named after him in Antarctica. Sometimes the passage through the Le Maire Channel is blocked by icebergs and packed ice. But if you're lucky to make it through, you will hit a beautiful island called Petermann. Uh, it is just two kilometers long and it was named after the German geographer August Petermann. It is home to the world's southernmost colony of Gentoo penguins. It also has Adelie penguins and a lot of seabirds breeding there. And very often scientists come to this uh, Peterman Island to do some research. Uh, in one bay at Peterman Island, there are some icebergs that have uh, run aground. Um, and so we have this, this small area, which is called like uh, um, the Iceberg Cemetery. Peterman Island has a really stunning scenery. 
some ships go further down um, and go all the way to the southern polar circle but we're turning around here and on the way back uh, north we're stopping at Paradise Bay. Paradise Bay was named so by the whalers who used to go there for refuge <coughs> and it is uh, one of the really beautiful bays in Antarctica. It's protected from the winds, surrounded by glaciers, um, going down all the way into the sea. There are two stations in the area of Paradise Bay. One is from Chile and one is from Argentina. In the nearby Herrera Channel is a famous island called Cuverville. Um, it's um, um, a home to a very, very large gentoo penguin colony. Um, and it was uh, named uh, by Adrian de Gellach after um, Cavalier de Cuverville, a vice admiral of the French Navy. Um, Cuverville Island is um, very popular with uh, expedition ships because of the large penguin colony. And uh, this is a very early picture of the season. It was taken in October when the penguins just come ashore to uh, establish established a breeding colony. So they first they come ashore, they find a partner, then they build a nest with uh, stones. And then finally the breeding starts, they lay two eggs. And uh, if they're lucky, they have two chicks and bring them up. And then by February, everything is over. And uh, end of February, early March, they're all back into the water, their natural habitat. At the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula is another area where you can set foot on the peninsula itself. It's called Brown Bluff. That's another mainland landing. Brown Bluff uh, is um, highlighted by a spectacular 745 meter steep volcano cliff. And uh, the whole area is uh, full of um, um, shaped boulders that lie scattered uh, across the ash beach. There are also some uh, 20,000 nesting pairs of Adelie penguins and hundreds of Gen 2s breeding on the slopes of the volcano in Brown Bluff. Brown Bluff uh, is located uh, at the Antarctic Sound. The Antarctic Sound is uh, 48 kilometer long um, um, sound that's uh, separating Joinville Island from the northernmost tip of the Antarctic. The sound was named um, by the Swedish Antarctic Expedition and their ship, the Antarctic, which uh, sank there in the early 1900s. Antarctic Sound is also called the Valley of the Icebergs, as you can see tabula icebergs there. The tabula icebergs, the largest type of icebergs, um, they break off the shelf ice. Most of the big shelf ices are ice shelf ice areas are in the Weddell Sea on the other side of the peninsula. And once they're broken off, they slowly drift north uh, until they eventually run aground and melt. But a tabula iceberg can be several kilometers long and it might take you um, several hours to pass it. There is a, a Chilean station called Esperanza in Hope Bay. Esperanza is uh, the, the Spanish word for hope. Um, it's one of the larger places um, where people live in Antarctica. It's supposed to be a scientific station, but it's uh, also the place where the first baby in Antarctica was born. So um, that was mainly so that Argentina could claim um, the land as theirs. Although due to the Antarctic Treaty, um, all of Antarctica is um, considered a wildlife area and uh, it doesn't belong to particular countries as long as the treaty is in place. So after this look at the Antarctic Peninsula, I would like to uh, briefly show you the wildlife that the, you can encounter there. First of all, there are three types of breeding penguins. That's the Gen 2 penguin is the largest of them. An adult Gen 2 can reach a height of uh, 
30 to 36 inch or um, 75 to 90 centimeters. That's the largest uh, breeding penguin in the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, larger penguins uh, are, for example, the uh, king penguin and the emperor penguin, but they, they may pass through there occasionally, but they breed uh, in other areas further south and further north. The Gen 2 penguin lays uh, two eggs and um, both parents then share the incubation, changing uh, their duty daily and uh, the, egg hatch, the eggs hatch after 34 to 36 days and if uh, the breeding was successful they have two little um, Gen 2 penguin chicks. When the chicks grow older, both uh, the parents have to go to the water to provide, to find food, krill. Penguins eat krill, so um, to, to feed the little ones, um, both parents are um, always at sea, um, trying to get as much krill as possible. The penguins build their nests with stones, because there's no wood in Antarctica. And when they're not breeding, penguins actually live in the sea. They are seabirds, they are swimming seabirds. Another type of penguin that's breeding in the peninsula is the Adelie penguin. It's a little bit uh, smaller than the Gen 2 and it has uh, two distinctive marks. Um, uh, well, the marks are white rings surrounding the eyes. They were named by Dumont d'Urville after his wife Adelie. And their chicks are little brown fluff balls. They look very different to their parents. And here's a picture of an Adelie penguin feeding their chick with krill. And the final and uh, third type of um, breeding penguin is the chin strap. Um, the name derives from the narrow black strap under their heads. And uh, it, uh, they look a little bit as if they're wearing a helmet. And here we have uh, ch some uh, chinstrap penguin chicks as well. There are also larger animals in the Antarctic Peninsula, for example, seals. We have the Weddell seal, named after Sir James Weddell, commander of a British sealing expedition. And uh, it's estimated that there are still about 800,000 Weddell seals left today in Antarctica. But what does a penguin do when he returns to his nest and um, a seal is sitting on it? This penguin tried with all its power to push the seal off the nest. Luckily the nest was still empty at that time. It was early in the season so no eggs were laid yet and thus not destroyed. Um, but the penguin fought with all its power uh, uh, to get the seal off its nest. Finally, um, the seal gave way and since they were still sitting next to each other, the penguin protected um, its space by biting the seal in the flap. The largest um, seal on the whole planet is the southern elephant seal. Uh, those beautiful animals were hunted to the brink of extinction by the end of the uh, 19th century, but numbers have re recovered a bit. Um, it was the sealers that were after the blubber, um, same way as they uh, used the whale blubber. They used to cook the oil out of the blubber. So elephant seals are the largest seals in the world. We also have one type of furry seal, the fur seal. Um, it's a close relative of the sea lion. Male fur seals can be very aggressive. But also this type of seal was hunted almost close to extinction for their fur, but uh, some survived and now they are very numerous in Antarctica and uh, also in the surrounding peninsulas. The leopard seal is the second, second largest species of seal in the Antarctic and it is near the top of the Antarctic food chain. Orcas are the only natural predators of leopard seals and leopard seals do feed off penguins as well. Orcas can be seen in Antarctica. They are usually seen in schools. Here we have one male with a school of uh, females. But uh, in Antarctica is a subspecies of orca. It is not white and black. It is more gray and black 
in color. We also have real whales in Antarctica. In the summer months, you can see um, various type of whales, but mostly the humpback whale. Humpback are baleen whale. Um, they can grow up to 12, 13 meters long. And they are often seen in the bays uh, of Antarctica, usually uh, in the evening when they are feeding of krill. The sea birds we see in the Antarctic Peninsula are mostly uh, blue-eyed shakes and the land bird is the snowy she-spill and then we have some petrels, the cape petrel and the giant, uh, giant petrel here on this picture together with an Adeli penguin. And we also have the skuas. Um, the skuas are very numerous in Antarctica. Um, they prey on penguin eggs and on penguin chicks. Um, but they also have their young to feed. So these are the main birds that you would encounter on a visit to the Antarctic Peninsula. So this is it for today. Uh, I hope uh, I could give you like a small overview over this beautiful and remote area of our planet and um, I hope to see you in the next for the next presentation. Um, I will I'm planning to make uh, presentations from remote areas and also famous sites um, from all continents of the world. So please uh, do hit the uh, subscribe button if you like the bell and um, thank you very much for your time and for listening.